Hello, everybody. My name is Alexis Boylan. I am the Director of Academic Affairs at the University of Connecticut's Humanities Institute, and it is my great pleasure today to be interviewing Jane Wild Goose, artist and scholar, and uh, I'll actually let her introduce herself. But I did also want to mention that this is a interview that is being produced for the Seeing Truth exhibition and has been generously funded by the Luce Foundation, as well by support from the University of Connecticut. So Jane, hello, welcome. It is lovely to see you. And I did want to actually foreground all of this before you even introduce yourself by saying that I owe Amy Myers a great debt um, because she is the one who introduced me. <laughs> great Amy Myers, former uh, director of the Yale British uh, Museum and just a fabulous uh, scholar um, and friend. And I feel very um, lucky that she introduced me to you and that now I get this opportunity to further introduce you and your work to the world. So big props to Amy Myers and Jane, would you introduce yourself? And likewise from me too, to Amy, uh, for introducing me to Alexis, but also for introducing me to the collections at Yale University some years ago, which I was going to mention in my introduction. So yes, I am an artist and a writer, researcher, and I work uh, to commission with museums and um, historic collections and historic sites. So in America, I have worked with Amy Myers at the Yale Center for British Art with the Yale collections of natural history at the Peabody and the Yale University Art Gallery and the rare books at um, the Yale Center for British Art. And that was all about collecting in the 18th century. In this country, I've worked with Sir John Soane's Museum, with the Rothschild Collection at Waterston, with Historic Royal Palaces at South Kensington, but also I have my own collection. You can see tiny fragments of it behind me. My own collection, which is central to my practice, to my thinking, to my practice-based research, um, although I do academic research, historical research as well. And I have a great interest in the history of collecting. My research interests um, combine an interest in death studies, um, the history of memory and remembrance, and the history of collecting, and where those things intersect. And my own collection is um, a bit of a beachcombers collection, it's called the Wild Goose Memorial Library, and um, I infiltrate objects from my collection into my historic installations, working with historic collections, uh, but I also work with my collection very closely and it informs much of my thinking um, about more established collections. That's probably, probably sums it up for now. Perfect. So I'm already going to warn you that I'm going to pick on you to further sort of pull apart the differences between the collector and the artist and the scholar. And because those were different terms that you used in describing yourself. I never describe myself as a scholar. I'm always very flattered when other people describe me as a scholar. I do describe myself as a researcher and a researcher. Writer. Yeah, see, it's, I think that's, a, it, it, it's an American slippage that I will, I'll just forgive you. It's a lovely term. I just, I just don't, I, I don't bestow it on myself. <laughs> That's interesting. Do you not like the word scholar? Does that feel? I, do. Good? I think it's. Uh, I think it's something to aspire to. Yeah. Okay. But I'm not primarily an academic. I am a practitioner who does academic research. I mean, you know, I did my doctorate um, in a school of art and design history, but as a practice-based student, and that is quite an important um, distinction for me because much of my historical and archival research it's informed by my sensibilities as an artist, or rather the conclusions and the things that I draw from it. I would, I would make that distinction, actually, yes. Do you think that if you were a scholar, they wouldn't be? That they would be motivated by something else? Well, when I started, I used to have arguments with scholars about the way that I approached history. And okay. that I was interested in the emotional lives of objects. And I can remember being told years ago, by a graduate from Oxbridge that, well, you can't do history like that. Um, whereas now it is much more integrated. And I think, um, that, yeah, that's been quite a revolution in the way that people think, particularly about material culture today's, uh, today, and are more prepared to look into the subjective world that, that surrounds material culture. But that's been very central 
to my thinking from kind of day one. I, I trained as a textile designer and I worked in theatre um, as a costume designer predominantly, but I also worked um, making installation for performance. And um, I used to teach textile art students as well as textile designers. And the conversations, particularly for textile art students about materiality were always mm -hmm. very interesting. Um, I worked in a, a tapestry department that was within a fine art department. And our stu I remember students coming back and laughing when they'd been to um, a seminar with sculpture students and saying, they were saying things like, I think I it's work with wood now, or I think it's time that I worked in bronze. And this was some years ago, but, but their thing was always, but you choose the material because the way that it speaks about the subject that you're working on. Right. Um, it's not a material that you pluck because that's in the canon. You use it because of the way that, you know, we've worn textiles all our life. I mean, these are these are classic conversations, you know, material culture, but but they weren't, <laughs> you know, when I, when I was starting out. Um, this idea that, you know, we've all worn textiles since day one, that they are incredibly evocative, that they hold, they can hold memories, they can hold lots of associations. And this way of thinking is very particular to um, my practice as an artist who then combines it with really hopefully very careful and rigorous academic and historical research as well. I love this idea of the practitioner. In some ways, it does seem like that it is a practitioner obliterates the possibility of being a scholar or, or that there seems to be a little a, a, a tension there though that I think there's tension there's certainly uh, tension yeah there. and yeah. I think and, something that I certainly see in the world um, of academia where we're more particularly in this country um, more artists are doing uh, postdoctorates and PhDs particularly um, right. where the interface with with the academic structure and, and if you like academic formulae um, uh, frameworks um, it, uh, is a constant um, kind of conversation for practitioners and, and I do think you're using quite different parts of yourself uh, but that doesn't mean to say you can't bring them together and you can't be rigorous with both right. and that's, that's something I'm very concerned with is being rigorous with both parts of, right. of my, my operation. Well it's fascinating because I do think that I, I think that in terms of my field and the scholarship that I involved with and, and my own identity as a, I'm now sort of very, feeling very awkward about identifying myself as a scholar, but um, I, I have think not what I said. No, 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 you were, no, it was great. But I think that, that the sort of idea of um, there is a real push within academia to be more personal, to be more of a practitioner to, and I think certainly, you know, some great works by Sadia Hartman and others have suggested the sort of the, this, this imagination of not being a practitioner has actually done a great deal of damage to academia and to imagine this division between a self that could ever somehow be apart from that which we produce is actually a deeply embedded problem um, uh, in knowledge production and something that I know you and I both engage with in our own sort of dialogues. I wanted to come back to something just because I want our audience to understand exactly what you mean. You said that you um, are interested in death studies. Can you explain a little bit what you mean by that and, and what, what, how that how that has evolved in your work or if that was something that was always present? I, I would say there probably wasn't much in the way of death studies when I was starting out all those years ago and in fact it started when I was a student on a very commercial textile design print course um, with a wonderfully, John Crane if you're out there thank you, uh, my tutor, a wonderfully supportive and just encouraged me to go with a really quite idiosyncratic flow, which was not commercial textiles, which is why I ended up in theatre. I became really, really fascinated with Miss Havisham in Great Expectations. And when the small boy Pip, who is the narrator, um, is summoned to Miss Havisham's house, Miss Havisham, for those who don't know, I'm sure everyone knows the story, but this is Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. Miss um, Havisham is uh, a woman advanced in years, 
who has been jilted on her wedding day as a young woman. And uh, she was a very wealthy and privileged woman and very cross <laughs> about this. And she refused to take off her wedding dress. She left her banquet all around her um, and lived in decay, this terrible decaying um, splendor for the rest of her life. And so this small boy Pip is summoned to play at her house. And the description of her when he first sees her is that she looks like um, a waxwork that he's seen at the fair. But she also looks like a skeleton in the ashes of a rich dress that had been dug up from the pavement in a marsh, on a, in a church on the marshes. And then it goes on to say that, but waxwork and skeletons seem to have dark eyes that moved and followed him. And this idea of this sort of walking corpse, really, and this woman who is uh, her dress, her surroundings, all um, speak of her emotional and physical and psychic disintegration over the years. Um, and these are really central themes in, in my work now. So that's where it began. Uh, then I became very interested as a costume designer in, in the history of mourning costume and then associated um, material culture to do with mourning. And, you know, at that time in London, there were still one or two very Victorian funeral parlours with their, you know, their extraordinary window dressings with, you know, black feathers and fabulous Victorian signage, um, big black drapes. Um, all of that's been swept away now, but these things really, really, really fascinated me. And so I started collecting all things to do with this. And also became really interested in, um, through my interest in wanting to do more research into the idea of what the, the skeleton in the ashes of a rich dress that was Miss Havisham might be. I went to the British Museum and was drawing in the Egyptian department where there is a, a naturally mummified body that had been dug out of the sand, presented as if it was in, in the sand. Um, I did drawings of that. I was drawing from photographs of the mummies in Palermo, which literally are skeletons in the ashes of rich dresses in a crypt. And I became very interested in uh, mourning jewellery and especially mourning jewellery containing hair, which would, I had no idea at the time, but would become a very, very significant part of my work. So those are just some of, uh, of the things that I think of as my, my death studies. The history of anatomy as well. I'm just looking around here, actually. Uh, Mexican Day of the Dead. I'm looking at some of the things I've got in <laughs> of my prompts to, to what these things were that, um, that, that really started me off. Well, so I'm going to pull you back now um, and ask you to tell us a little bit about the Wild Goose Memorial Library and when your collecting began and sort of if you could talk to us a little bit about what you see now as the mission of the library. I probably started collecting, you know, completely unconsciously as a small child growing up on the south coast of England, uh, right by the sea and making regular trips on the beach and being really a bit of a beachcomber and always taking something home with me. And then as I grew up and left home, I went to Winchester School of Art in Hampshire at a time when there were lots of, lots of places where you could buy the most amazing um, vintage clothing, 1920s ball gowns, Victorian things, corsets. And I was buying and collecting these things, all sorts of things that just appealed to me. And gradually, my collecting really became much more focused on being, as, as so many artists do, you know, collecting things that are resources for, for the projects that you're engaged in and, and even really the wider thinking out of which those, those projects come. And uh, gradually, uh, as I became more and more interested in, in the history of mourning and death and remembrance, it took a swerve <laughs> to being uh, much more about those, those subjects. And also I began playing. I got really then interested in the history of collecting, but it was always a beachcombers collection. This is a really important thing. I mean, the things that I was collecting and my interest in, in mourning and the Victorians, you know, all those years ago, nobody was interested. There were very few people uh, were interested in that. That's not the case now. You know, there's great interest in this subject. So one thing that's really important is that this is a beachcombers collection. So it's not about um, objects of virtue. It's not about um, things that are worth a lot of money. Certainly not when I picked them up. They were not popular. In fact, I was really interested in the things that were discarded, the things that were sort of 
on the on the ground in a box underneath the table that was a market stall in in the street um literally picking things up in the street and i started sort of playing with this idea of um producing a collection that wasn't just about feeding my work although it was doing that at the same time but it was actually kind of somehow by these rather dubious means of just picking up any, anything that had washed up at the sort of margins of, mm -hmm. of the world, um, that might look as though it was part of a natural history and finer decorative arts collection. So I was just, I was being very playful and very ignorant. I had no idea about um, the implications of the history of those kind of collections. So when you ask me about a mission statement, that is really important because the mission statement is really much more, much more recent thing. Um, but also the question of a library. But for me, it was a library and not a museum because I was interested in the way that objects can be read and the narratives that become associated with objects. And so um, when the library really got launched, um, soon after I launched it and gave it that name, I had a fellowship in this country where I was investigating what my collection meant and um, what it meant to be the keeper because I'd just been kind of playing with this idea and one of the things that I did over quite a long period about a year was to invite people here to be photographed with objects from the collection to tell me what they wanted I have a very large cabinet here I emptied it out I would make an installation for them before they arrived thinking a lot about the person and then I also asked them to bring an object which they would not tell me about in advance but they were going to have their portrait taken photographically. And once they sat with their portrait, I would ask them to get all stood for it or whatever they were going to do. Um, I asked them to get their objects out and to tell me about it and had the most profound conversations with people, uh, really extraordinary. And then something that I wasn't anticipating, which really went with this idea of reading objects in the library, I think, um, I realized that the things that, came from my collection that were in the cabinet after they left, photographing them after people had told me their stories, I was getting so much more interesting photographs of my collection than I had ever been able to take before. I'd always been disappointed if I tried to photograph objects from the collection, either singly or, or in groups. Um, but as soon as I was informing my photographs with these conversations that I'd had with my sitters, they just came to life. Um, and that, that practice, genuinely practice-based research would go on to inform a lot of my thinking in the future. I love the idea of a library as a place where we go to do reading, because it does seem like you're uh, very purposely perhaps separating that from a collection or a museum where perhaps less reading happens and more of something else happens. So I think I, I just want to sort of tag that because I, I love this tension again that I see between what you're asking of the objects and what perhaps if we put it in another location, the objects are forced into a different role or a different sort of way of, of, of existing with us. And, and that's very relevant to the mission statement. So I would say the mission statement now is that the library really exists to, um, to give a platform and a forum uh, for many things to do with the history of collecting, but for taking very seriously the idea that objects may be read and that they may retain an emotional charge and an emotional life, which depending on who is interacting with them may be felt um, or not felt or somewhere on that spectrum. And, and, and my practice is very much about um, listening listening to that, that charge and those stories. It's a very different idea of collecting. If, if, if one, I mean, I think particularly when thinking about collecting and thinking about capitalism, there does seem to be sometimes a sort of suggestion of a kind of, like people collect as a kind of mania. So often when people sort of think about um, collecting, there's a kind of uh, a self-satisfaction, that it's about the person sort of satisfying some need for completion or some desire to have this collection. But it's actually very interesting because I do think that you sort of suggest this way in which your library is actually, although clearly instigated by you, um, that the objects themselves and then the conversations that the objects have become the primary vector 
of communication, which actually really does fundamentally change the idea of collecting from, I think, one that may, we might be more familiar with, the, the sort of the, 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 the wealthy um, industrialist who then has to have all the pieces of porcelain or all of the, you know, African masks or the, this sort of thing of collecting as a kind of way of uh, mastery. It, you seem to be suggesting that's exactly maybe, maybe mine is mistressy <laughs> <laughs> i think that's a very important point that you're making and as you were talking i was thinking about um my concern with the agency right the object right um and that to me yeah that's a very important thing but it seems like you want to liberate the object that the that the library becomes a place of liberation not confinement it also produces so much agency for again the the researcher that, that one goes to a library to research and to to enter into a conversation exactly to produce a forum in which we may give support credibility authority to aspects of thinking about objects which are easily discredited by some some people um, and certainly i have given a mission statement in the past in fact it was in my yale show which was that um that the the collection policy of my collecting policy was based on how an object appeals to the senses and the imagination and and the things that it can evoke. I wanted to pull us back to the Seeing Truth exhibition because so much of what that project seeks to sort of problematize are these links between science and art and museums and collecting and knowledge making and how often sort of collecting is deemed as important for knowledge making and therefore has a moral imperative and therefore museums have moral imperatives and artists and scientists and we all get sort of washed in this great sort of we're searching for knowledge um, uh, question and, and I think I, I'm interested in sort of what what truth has to do with your collecting and your interest in the library as an alternative space and, and objects as having perhaps alternative voices and what you see then as sort of the connections between knowledge making, art, science and collecting. That's like a, like, like a, my students would balk at that. They would say that's actually 17 questions that you've just given us and they're all impossible. So, um, so I will let you do with that what you will. <laughs> well, you know, what is truth? What is science? <laughs> what is knowledge? Um, so I do believe that my collection is looking at all kinds of truths, but what do we mean by truth? <laughs> um, a lot of my research, and this is an area of my work, which has a very big mission statement of its own, which um, I've done in the last sort of 16, 15, 16 years, uh, which is questioning the truth um, that has been associated with museums for many years in, um, in their collection of human remains, the way that they are interpreted or have been interpreted, certainly at the point of collection. I have been looking at definitions of science and truth um, and really thinking, well, well, what does truth mean to me? I've been looking at the OED. It doesn't quite have what I think. It says things like, <laughs> like it. something that conforms with fact or reality. Well, you know, museums have been giving us facts about, um, about human remains or were giving us in the late 19th and early 20th century human remains collected from the colonies as truth and fact, which um, we certainly don't think is the case now. Uh, so some of what I do is winkling out those maladjustments <laughs> of truth and knowledge. And I think this is at the heart of your, your Seeing Truth project. Um, I think for me, when I'm doing archival research, I feel that truth is um, is is evidence based. Uh, but then, on the other hand, the scientists who produced the racial science around human remains would say it was evidence based as well. They were measuring measuring skulls, and that looks beautifully empirical and objective, and um, not an ideology wrapped up as science, which in fact clearly it was. Um, from where I'm standing. Uh, so I'm digging into archives. Um, but then, of course, you know, when we're looking at the truth of evidence, we're always having to think again about positionality. Where's it coming from? Um, I also um, 
I was taught by somebody when I was doing my PhD who'd been um, doing her research in the ICA in London about um, artists who were still alive. And she ended up in a court case because there was somebody who was dealing in the, uh, one of the artist's paintings who was putting false information in the archives in order to boost the, the, the value of that person's artwork. So, um, you know, archives have to be treated carefully as well. Um, so truth, yes, truth. I'm picking, I'm picking evidence, thinking about our own positionality and the positionality of those who, who presented it as truth and trying to find something meaningful. What is your relationship as an artist to truth? Do you feel obligated to truth or do you feel um, perhaps cagey around it? Well, again, you know, what is truth? Um, myths, it seems to me, I'm very keen on mythology, ancient mythology. Um, you know, these stories about people who lived thousands and thousands of years ago, which still seem to resonate with us today with the most profound psychological truths. So uh, as an artist, um, I've sometimes thought that the greatest truths may be in myths, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the most valuable ones. Um, that's a different thing from peddling untruths for the sake of ideology. It seems like a good time to ask about your project um, uh, with the Natural History Museum in London. Um, you sort of made some oblique references to it, but um, uh, I, I find this project and your work around this um, fascinating. Uh, and, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, your time there, your time at the museum and how that perhaps impacted um, your collecting, your relationship to your own library um, and your art practice. And actually just to you, um, it was very heavy work. And so um, uh, I'm interested in sort of your, what was your relationship as a witness um, in the archives? Well, <laughs> um, this was a watershed for me. And um, I was commissioned by um, uh, the special, special projects at the Natural History Museum, who were um, working with um, looking at some of the, the more difficult questions that were raised by, by the work that went on from the researchers in the museum. And in 2006, and, and I mentioned that I've been photographing people with objects. And uh, that piece of practice-based research, which as I said, took place over a year, um, it was at the end of that year that I was invited or commissioned to uh, write a report on the human remains collection at the Natural History Museum. Within the context of uh, a change to the law having occurred in this country, which I think um, you may well be aware of, or you will certainly be aware of NACRA in your own, uh, the National Native Americans' grave. Um, uh, the, the whole question of repatriation of indigenous ancestral remains from museums collected during the 19th and early 20th centuries. And in this country, the National Museum. I will interrupt you and say that in the United States, this has gone on well into the 20, you know, deep into the 21st uh, century. That recently we've had a very big scandal at um, uh, the University of Pennsylvania um, having. Uh, so, yes, I mean, this doesn't, this is not deep history. This is very recent history. Yeah. It's interesting for you to say that because um, I, yes, and I think the kind of thinking around it um, right. has a very enduring. Um, presence, um, although great work has also been done <laughs> and is being done. So in this country, the national museums in particular um, were, were actually subject to the British Museum Act 1963, which has all sorts of caveats. And one of them is that uh, nothing could be removed from the collection, except under very, very special circumstances, if there were duplicates or, um, you know, if it was pest ridden and beyond redemption. And so as, um, as groups of Indigenous people from around the world were addressing museums in the UK and asking for their ancestors' remains to be returned to their communities and their lands, um, the, 
the the national museums were were saying quite rightly legally that they couldn't address this um and so in 2000 i think it was um john howard who was then australian prime minister and our own prime minister tony blair made a public statement um that this country would actually look into the number of human remains that were in museums and address the situation on behalf of Australian Aboriginal people who wanted their ancestral remains back. And uh, to cut a long story short, uh, the law was changed and um, a special case was made for human remains that they could be understood as both objects of research and study and exhibition. Uh, but also that it must be understood that they were also subjects, vital subjects um, for many people. Um, and in 2006, the Natural History Museum, after that change to the law, were addressing their first claim from the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre for 17 um, individuals' remains that had been taken under the worst possible circumstances in Tasmania when, you know, when virtually everyone was um, eradicated due to British colonial occupation and settlement. And so I was brought in, um, really uh, nothing to do with the adjudicating panel that decided what should happen to those remains, but really with a view to doing some groundwork uh, towards opening up conversations within and outside the museum about the issues. And I was given three weeks. <laughs> Um, and I wasn't allowed to look at any human remains because only sci scientists were allowed to look at human remains who were doing uh, research projects that had been um, been passed. So there was this fascinating kind of power um, hierarchy going on. As an artist, I, I was absolutely not equipped to look at the human remains. However, I didn't need to. Um, I was interviewing uh, members of staff and I was also looking in the archives. And one day when I was researching um, around the time that they had made the decision that they would indeed return the 17 individuals remains to Tasmania, but they wanted to keep them um, for three months and do testing on them, which the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre had made absolutely clear they didn't want to happen. Um, anyway, a, a, very, uh, a very thorough uh, press pack was given out uh, when this was announced and a copy of it was put on the table where I'd been researching in the library and um, looking at it, they had presented uh, the information that they had about all of the 17 individuals. And I really just wanted, they didn't all come directly through the museum. Some of them had come from other museums. Some had come from the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Some had come from uh, Oxford University. A couple had come from the Wellcome Trust. And um, I just wanted to find out if there was anyone in the museum at the time um, and find out what the correspondence had been. And so I asked the archivist, I, I could only find one name uh, relating to, to the, the ones to come straight into the museum and that, that was a member of staff at the museum at that time. And um, so I just said, have you got anything about this person? And a big stack of letters was brought out um, and given to me. These letters were extraordinary. Uh, it contained letters from people in the colonies who were supplying human remains. But at the same time, I was looking at the press pack and reading and contrasting the way that members of staff in the museum had reported on those human remains, um, the ones that were, were going to be returned, and the, their take on the history of how they've been acquired. And then I read the report by the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre. And reading that report, I almost vomited. I was so horrified by the historic circumstances that surrounded the collection of those human remains um, that my practice as an artist, I realise now, uh, would change forever. And uh, I went away and did a great deal of research um, to try and contextualise what I had found and presented it to the museum. Um, and I've really been working pretty much on, you know, that, that, is a, that has become a constant subject of my work. It became the, um, the, the, not the natural history collection, but actually the, the Royal College of Surgeons collection became the focus of, um, of my research for my, my doctoral practice. And it also made me, you said about 
my practice and my own collection. Um, I'm looking up at them now. I have two human skulls in my collection, uh, which were given to me. One came from an artist studio, uh, Barbara Jones, who uh, herself was a great collector and very interested in all things to do with death. And the other, I'm just looking up at it, um, came from the family of a, a dentist and amateur archaeologist who they understood had got it on a dig um, at Waltham Abbey um, sometime probably in the 1950s or 60s when, when you could take away skulls in that way. And I had made a radio program uh, with the American radio artist Gregory Whitehead um, about, he bought one of a kind of split end, uh, one of Nelson's hair, hairs um, on eBay and we made a little program about it and it, it was very much about how how such a tiny object could tell actually a very big story about a very big man, uh, but also thinking about our responsibilities in being in possession of it. And I had the opportunity to make another radio program with Gregory and the producer we worked with, um, Neil McCarthy. And uh, I said, look, I want to ask some of these questions that I'm asking of the museum of myself. What should I be doing with, with these skulls that I have? And I want to find out as much about them as I can and pose those questions um, in public. So, so that, that was a, a big move for me um, in developing my practice and, and quite a uh, foundational one in terms of where I then went with, with that work. There's a great sort of discussion um, internationally about sort of what to do with these museums and archives, which seem as much to be housing and in their housing almost normalizing a genocidal push that has dominated the 19th, 20th, and 21st century, particularly in Europe and the United States. What is your feeling about how, what care or attention we should be giving to these places, which are in fact housing, not just documents of genocide, but in fact, victims of it. Are these places that are worth saving? Are these institutions that are worth reinvesting in? Um, that, that, of course, there is such a push now to, I mean, and even the grant that you received is this push to sort of create openness and to mend the past and, you know, that museums now take great care in sort of noting all of the people who were patrons who might have had connections with, you know, coal collection or oil or this sort of, you know, that, that marking these turns seems to be a, an attempt to sort of create some balance or some a penance. Reparation. Right. Do you, do you believe in that? One of the first things I'd like to say is that I established that I have, which is a slight side issue, but I'll definitely come back to those and prompt me if I, I kind of get carried away. So um, I've established that I have two human remains, two human skulls that were donated to my collection. And in the course of making the, the radio program, um, I took the skulls to various experts to find out as much as I could about where they might have come from. And one of them was great interest to some archaeologists at Bradford University, with whom I had quite a heated discussion about repatriation. And I can, yeah, I can discuss this because they went on, one of them went on air and, and, and said that they had measured the, one of the skulls for me. And uh, that they, from, the, and they said, they said, um, the computer is in no doubt that this is an Australian Aboriginal skull. And so when I finished making the radio program, I got in touch with the Australian High Commission and the repatriation officer there, and I said I would like to repatriate this. And she was very pleased, and I had to get it independently measured at the Museum of London because they only have British Museum, British remains, so there's no kind of conflict of interest. And then that data was sent to an expert in Australia, and um, it would have been put through a database in the same way that it apparently was in this country. And I actually went on holiday and I came back to many, many phone calls and emails saying, have you seen the report? And the report concluded that the chances of this being an Australian skull were so vanishingly small, they could be dismissed. Um, science and truth. Um, measurements and empiricism. And uh, the expert in Australia had come to the conclusion using the same methodology 
that this uh, skull was from Patagonia. And I've always tried, uh, well, I tried at the time through the person, uh, the repatriation officer at the Australian High Commission to see if there was anyone, if she had a counterpoint uh, um, in the Patagonian embassy. And I, I never got anything back on that, but if there's anyone out there from Patagonia who um, would be interested in the repatriation of um, this skull, I would be very interested to hear from you. Um, because in some ways, it's, it's quite heavy on me that it is still here. Um, but I do feel also as there's been something of a, a guide to me. Uh, the other one from Waltham Abbey, I had an amazing conversation with, um, we went to Waltham Abbey, we talked to some experts there, and I talked to the incumbent there, who was a wonderful man, who, um, when I asked him the question, I was asking everyone, which was, well, what should I do with, with this skull? He said, beautifully, he said, um, well, he said it was a very difficult question, but uh, he felt that as an artist, if I could use it to help people to understand about death today, then I should hang on to it. But, but that maybe if I felt that I had accomplished that mission um, sometime, that we should bury it with due ceremony at Waltham Abbey. And again, I would like to do that. Um, I do feel it's time that these, these souls were put to rest. Um, but meanwhile, they sit here. So, so I just really wanted to explain that before, um, before going on to, to be critical about other institutions, because um, one of the really valuable things about looking at these questions through my own collection is to acknowledge how difficult it might be to let go of things and to, through working with curators and museums, to recognise the pressures they're under, the, the relationships of whatever kind that they make, um, the kind of territorial feelings of having objects under your care. So, um, yeah, I wanted to get that groundwork in mm -hmm. first. I think it's very helpful to talk about the intimacies that are of, of the objects and people, that, that these things are, um, I, I think that's very helpful. I think that's actually really um, important. Uh, it's very easy to demonize all kinds of people and create, you know, sort of stock characters of, you know, the devious curator and, you know, who's, you know, and the scientist who's more interested in numbers than in truth or some, you know, or complex cultural questions, but that actually the objects themselves and the, the people who engage with them, like these are all forces that, that pull and push at us, but I'm sorry. Actually, no, 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 I'm, I'm actually really, you know, I'm, I'm actually really loving here this because, you know, it's also the passion uh, uh, but it's also research grants. It's career. It's your profession. It's your job. You lose your your um, your raw materials and you're out of job. So th these are all profound issues um, and not simple to unpick. Um, the good side of this, I would say, is I've been doing some work recently with a um, with a, a art quest in this this country mm -hmm. who, who began yeah. twenty years ago as. Um, as an artist advocate group, uh, giving free legal advice to artists in London, and they've really branched out in what they do. And in recent years, one of the things they've been doing is funding and facilitating uh, small fellowships and, um, and, and opportunities for, for, or rather residences, not fellowships, residences with, uh, for artists to work with museum collections and, and immediately realizing, oh, well, this, this is not a straightforward thing to do. I've been working with them closely on a series of workshops, uh, which have been closed workshops under Chatham House rules, um, but looking at uh, questions of um, exactly these questions about the power of institutions and, and, and what they might do now. And, and how artists might be involved in that project. And um, one of the things that's been wonderful about it is some of the people that I have met who are really, really doing the most phenomenal work um, trying to address these issues. So for anyone who's interested, I would definitely say, look at the work that is currently going on at the Pitt Rivers Museum um, in Oxford um, and the work uh, that is being done there, uh, there's certainly just one project is um, called Labelling Matters, where they are drilling down deep into this, you know, what is also very valuable because it is a 19th century collection, which does not pretend, has not reworked the collection to give it a new context. It retains absolutely its taxonomy and its context. And it's really, really valuable in that respect for us to be able to look at, at how it was, you know, how it was, was um, 
and taxonomized originally. And But looking at the language that is used in the accession catalogues right through to the labels and questioning all the presumptions that existed at the time that those things were, were first put together and, and how that might be addressed now. And the other thing also that they're doing is working very closely where they can with the, the communities from whom many of the things in their collection derive and working with them, um, aiming to work with them as equals uh, rather than, um, again, you know, the, the, the power hierarchies that, that exist with, with possession of objects and, and their description and, and, and taxonomy and hierarchical um, you know, uh, knowledge ownership regarding them. Well, I could talk to you, Jane, for hours and hours, and I actually have a million more questions, but I'm afraid we have to wrap it up. So I'm going to ask you the final question that I am asking all of the interviewees, and that is about our instigator items. Um, I'm asking everybody which instigator item from our Seeing Truth exhibition and our online component um, spoke to you or uh, instigated you to make some connections with your own work or with some of the things we've discussed today, or that just actually provoked you again sort of in thinking about these objects as wanting to have their own conversations and having their own agency which one which one spoke to you uh, the one that spoke to me is um is actually a, a contemporary photograph i think it's from 1996 um it's by todd gray and it is called don't fade me out and carries the i have it here because i wanted to be sure that I was correct in, in, in how I described it. Um, uh, it. It has the subtitle, one out of four black men under 25 are incarcerated. And this spoke to me quite loudly um, because uh, I haven't perhaps spoken directly about this, but you know, the work that I have been doing around human remains and their collection from the colonies is on the basis of the fact that they were collected for the purposes of racial science provide data for theories of the hierarchies of the so-called races of mankind and it seems to me that i'm looking at this photograph it speaks to me so loudly um because if we're talking about truth and museums and science and art um i don't think we will ever unpick the kind of racialized um world in which we live if we don't address the foundations of so many of our museums, which are based on, I'm going to say it's pseudo science, science that, that, that pretends to be, or that thought it was, that really thought, I'm sure that it was empirical, uh, but that really was, was political ideology, uh, which was presented as truth and fact. This is institutional racism. And I think until we really address that and unpick it, um, we stand very little chance of ever having fewer than one out of four black men under 25 incarcerated. It's a beautiful piece. It's stunning. And we're lucky that the Benton Museum here at the University of Connecticut owns it. And Jane, I will look forward to hopefully soon bringing you out to see, to meet um, the Todd Gray piece, Object to Person, live. Thank you so much for taking your time and sharing your, um, your practice and your knowledge. It feels like a very generous gift to all of us. So thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. so much. It's lovely to talk to you.